And there we have a group that's working on various psychedelic studies, and we're currently running a clinical trial with psilocybin treating uh, patients with fibromyalgia. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I read some of your work looking at DMT, endogenous DMT, and the effects of ex exogenous DMT in rodents, um, which was very interesting. Can I just want to give people a little bit of a background in terms of what DMT is and, and what was known about it before getting into your work. So uh, can you give people like a cliff notes on like what is DMT chemically? How is it different from other psychedelics? Yeah, I, I think DMT is the most interesting psychedelic. Um, and that was my passion when I came into graduate school was to get involved in DMT research. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple molecule. It's structurally similar to... Uh, the neurotransmitter serotonin. It's also structurally similar to other psychedelics like uh, psilocybin. Um, and it's uh, it's a tryptamine and that's the chemical class that it, that it belongs to. And it's uh, it's dim it's got two methyl groups attached to the to the amino part of the tryptamine, making it dimethyltryptamine. Um, and it's got it's got an interesting history and actually a pretty long history in terms of uh, in terms of relative to other psychedelics. Um, it's an active comp component in the hallucinogenic brew ayahuasca, which has been used uh, across South America in various indigenous cultures for at least a thousand years. Um, and ayahuasca is a very important uh, ceremonial and medicinal brew that's been that's been consumed widely across, across South America. Um, and DMT was brought into sort of uh, Western science in the early 1900s. It was discovered in 1931 by a chemist named Richard Mansky. Um, and he discovered it and it was kind of set aside before it was investigated any further. And it wasn't until, I think it was 1955, um, Stephen Sara, a chemist in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, was interested in um, reports of uh, ethnographers that were studying uh, plant-based hallucinogens in South America, and they were bringing plants back and they were curious what the active compounds in the plants were that were causing these hallucinations and these uh, psychedelic -like experiences. And it was found that uh, DMT was a high, uh, uh, a candidate for, for that molecule to be the, the psychoactive compound. So he uh, administered or began the first clinical trial or the first uh, Western science research trial with DMT. And he administered it intramuscularly first to himself and then to participants and found that it was uh, indeed hallucinogenic and psychedelic. Um, how how much did he also, inject himself with? What's that? How much did he give himself? Uh, I don't remember the dose exactly, but but I'm sure there was quite a bit of trial and error because I think, uh, you know, obviously you would probably try an oral administration first. And I believe he did that and found that DMT mm. wasn't orally active um, and then had to go the intramuscular route to, 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 get, the, to get the effects. Um, so that kind of... Uh, brought some interest into this molecule, into this compound uh, as a psychedelic compound. And this was also kind of occurring around the time when um, LSD was, was being investigated in a, in a research context and in a clinical context, and also around the time of the dis discovery of serotonin as a naturally occurring endogenous compound that has has effects on mental states and mood and various other physiological and neurobiological functions. Um, so this, this idea of, uh, uh, I guess further on that is, uh, it was also soon discovered that DMT was a uh, naturally occurring endogenous compound. So it was, it was found in, first it was found in uh, rodents and then it was found to be detected in, um, in human bodily fluids and cerebral spinal fluid and blood and plasma. And when we say, um, so when we say it was, detected it was found to be an endogenous compound what exactly does that mean um so I, I know that it means it's found in the body but i want to make a distinction here between um was it did they figure out that it was produced in the body and doing something serving a biological function or was it detected at the body in very low levels and may just have been some kind of metabolic by byproduct and, and how do we actually decide which one hmm yeah, that's a good point. So I think the the latter is is the correct. So it was detected in um, in human bodily fluids, blood, urine, cerebral spinal fluid at, at very low levels, mm. which uh, are in, in in current understanding those levels are not 
recognized to be physiologically significant. So even today, after having known that DMT occurs in the body naturally, uh, we, we've known this for almost 75 years, we still don't know the function of DMT. And it, and it very much could be, like you said, a metabolic byproduct or, a, or an inactive metabolite. Um, but there's, uh, you know, still reason to investigate it for, for reasons that it, that it's a, it's, it's a naturally occurring compound and it likely does have some function. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it would be when they surprising when they found it in, in animal tissues, did, did they find it at higher levels back in like the mid 20th century? Um, not so much, uh, not, not, there wasn't really any comparative studies to show that DMT was at, uh, found at levels comparable to other um, you know, active metabolites or active neurotransmitters or signaling molecules. Most of the early work was actually done uh, indirectly. So what they would do is uh, try to trying to discover or understand the biosynthetic pathway of DMT. And they mm -hmm. would do that by taking enzyme extracts or tissue extracts and incubating them with the precursor molecules like tryptamine, and then finding out whether that tryptamine can be methylated to form N-methyltryptamine and then dimethyltryptamine. And that's sort of an indirect measure of uh, determining whether, uh, you know, DMT could be active or could be present in the body, in, in, in the mammalian body. I see. So, so DMT is a tryptamine, which means it's probably ultimately produced from tryptophan in the body. It's similar chemically to serotonin. It's similar to other psychedelics like psilocybin and psilocin. Uh, it was, you know, it was discovered, you know, decades and decades ago. Now they, they knew it was there. They could detect tiny amounts in cerebral spinal fluid in humans. They could detect small amounts in other animal tissues. At that time, it wasn't known if the DMT was produced in order to do something important in animal tissues, or it was just sort of a, a byproduct. And we we're just sort of detecting this inactive metabolite. Um, when do people start figuring out that this is the component of ayahuasca and that, that this is, uh, you know, the spirit molecule as Rick Strassman called it. Hmm. Those are, uh, sort of, sort of two separate events. And, uh, when it, it was discovered that DMT was a component of ayahuasca, uh, I think around the mid 20th century. So around, around the 1950s or so. Um, and that was, uh, like I said, the result of, um, ethnobotanists and ethnographers who were studying uh, indigenous cultures in the Amazon and in South America, bringing back plant samples or bringing back samples of ayahuasca or participating in ayahuasca ceremonies, and then bringing those samples back and then uh, using Western scientific methods to discover that that DMT was the active component. Um, interesting note, that's also, uh, it's just such a cool story that the ayahuasca story, the fact that um, not just one indigenous culture, but, you know, dozens uh, of indigenous cultures across many different countries across South America independently made this discovery of the combination of, of different plant admixtures that can result in the hallucinogenic effects of ayahuasca. And it's not just a hallucinogenic brew. It's this really important ceremonial and medicinal concoction that's, that's widely used across many different cultures. And, and these two plants, it's, it's a, it's a mul multiple plants that are used, but there's sort of two that are, are particularly important for ayahuasca. And these plants, these combination of these plants was found amongst some of the greatest botanical diversity in the world. You know, there's 30,000 species of vascular plants in the, in the Amazon. And the fact that these indigenous cultures have made this um, chemical discovery is uh, kind of a feat of, uh, of science. That's not really explainable. Interesting. Yeah. Because, you know, if you, th I think another way of saying what you just said is, so there are many different cultures in Central and South America that are combining plants in a way that results in an ayahuasca experience. So they're combining ultimately DMT with the MAOIs that enable it to be orally active. So there's a couple interesting things uh, I want to ask you about here. So one, do we know that they all independently discovered this or is it possible that the ayahuasca brew was discovered just a long time ago and sort of as people spread throughout Central and South America, they all inherited this culturally. Um, or is there clear evidence that you know, you know these these cultures were in complete isolation and they totally independently discovered this? Yeah, it's it's a really good point. Um, I I sort of lean toward the latter that it was an independent discovery, um, but uh, and and I sort of I sort of hypothesize that because of the geographical separation of, of the groups that discovered it and, and the, and the wide geographical range of discovery. Mm. Uh, 
but but you're right there could have been some some knowledge and information passed passed among groups so that's that's a good point <laughs> okay so it's used in multiple cultures that, i mean presumably right there's many cultures sort of in between them that don't use it so it either had to have been lost many times or or it was independently discovered but i think what you're saying is th- this is super fascinating how is it that people living in the jungle <laughs> that don't have chemistry labs and things like this. How did they figure this out? Because there's literally like millions of plants in the Amazon jungle. If you were to just randomly start sampling them and mixing them together at random, you would probably never happen upon the exact right combinations. And yet, if multiple cultures are using this, the question is really, by what method did they make this discovery? Is there any is there any information there? Like, if Have people asked them? How did you how did you guys discover this? Yeah, it's pretty simple. They um, they speak to the plants. <laughs> um, that's that's the answer you get, or that's the answer I've heard. There's uh, there's there's a communication with uh, with nature in a way that is not uh, accessible or uh, reasonable or normal for us for for maybe us in, in modern scientific labs like 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 as 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 you said. Um, and you know, there's, uh, I'm not sure if you've read much into the ethnobotany of this, but, or if your listeners have, but there's, um, you know, Richard Evan Schultes was kind of the father of ethnobotany. And he talked about how this is one of the greatest mysteries of ethnobotany, how this, this discovery was made, um, amongst some of the greatest botanical diversity in the world. And, uh, one of his students, Wade Davis was uh, a person who kind of carried on that legacy of Schultes and, and, and Wade Davis has written uh, a few books that are just fascinating. And I, I'd, I'd recommend others to, to check out some of his work. And he is, um, an anthropologist who has studied a number of different, uh, different cultures across the world. And one of his, one of his take homes that, I, that I've received from his work is there's just many different ways of knowing. There's many different ways of ex- accessing knowledge and accessing information. And he talks about, um, you know, Polynesians uh, who are able to, you know, navigate by the stars and by measuring uh, the, the, the size of the waves or the, the pattern of the pattern of the ocean um, in ways that is just unfathomable to, to sort of modern uh, seafarers, I, I suppose, and and many many different other um, observations of accessing knowledge via ways that are sort of difficult for us to understand. So so that's that's sort of my hypothesis with these indigenous cultures uh, in in South America. They may have some relationship with with nature that is sort of beyond beyond our capacity to to understand and that may have allowed them to to make make this make this discovery but that's about all I can all I can say about that and so we find obviously DMT is found in certain plants psychotria viridis is is the one that you often hear about how common is DMT in the plant world because I know it's not found in just one plant it's found in a number of them how common is it and do we know anything about why the plants are producing it yeah, I, th- I think that would be such a cool study to do is to do a really thorough investigation of um, maybe maybe not even just individual plants, but like large families of plants. And let's find out how many of them actually do contain DMT, because the general notion is that people say that DMT is in everything. They say that, you know, I've, I've heard Dennis McKenna say this. Um, 